Hello and welcome to the USA Rugby Clubhouse, brought to you by the rugbyshop.com for all your rugby apparel needs. I'm your host, Ben Foden. Um, I'm obviously joined by none other than Mr. Mike Petrie, my partner in crime. Um, having missed, missed last week because of a facial injury that I picked up against uh, New England. How you feeling, dude? How's, uh, what's with the sunnies? What's going on? Yeah. Taking them 17 years, mate. It's taken them 17 years to get me, but they got me. Is that your first time. injury to your face? First, like, first stitches on my face, yeah. We've got two weeks to recap, Mikey. A lot happened. A lot of ups, a lot of downs. Lots have changed. Um, first of all, New England uh, beating Rooney really put a spanner in the works. I don't think too many people saw it coming, but it, it happened, and it meant that things really heated up in the East Coast Conference because Nola went and pulled it out the bag with the biggest upset of the season and beat LA at home for the first time. So those two things happening meant that Nola would then jump ahead of Rooney um, and, and meant that it was all to play for in the, in the Eastern Conference. And then Seattle just coming in and absolutely raining on the New Orleans parade last weekend. <laughs> just like... It's all going on. Who would have seen that? Beating LA, the top of the West Coast, undefeatable at home, beat them. Go away to Seattle, bottle in the West Coast, and, and and lose by thirty points to six. I don't think many people saw that coming, no, but it, it, no, it still it still left the door open. I mean, they did they didn't get a point from the game, and obviously uh, Rooney playing against Houston and, and winning big there, getting the five points that we needed there. We have the five point buffer, so what it means is Nola have to beat New York. New York can't score four tries. Nola need four tries, and they must win by twenty points or more. Correct. Yep. Is that what it is? And, and we can't yeah. finish within seven. All of that is correct. But you know what? It's that was like the perfect storm for you guys. I mean, awful, awful performance against New England. That just credit to them. It was their last game at that stadium. They mm -hmm. were up for it. They played really well. Our guest from a couple of weeks ago, Odin Waka, played fantastic at 10, just kept putting the ball in behind you guys, Good. making you go backwards in some horrific conditions. And they just, they had the pressure on you all game. They had you going backwards. They capitalized when they needed to and made life miserable for you. But then you turned around and obviously knew that you had a job to do against Houston and then just ran the scoreboard up and put, I think, the second most points uh, of any team in the season so far. I think L.A. had you with like 57 or some odd and you were up at like 54 or something like that. So you had to put big numbers up. You knew that. You had to keep Houston down and you did that. So it gave you that that point margin, that buffer, as you, as, as you said, between yourselves and New Orleans and then Seattle, who have just been on fire. I mean, I remember the question you asked and you were like, what do you do if you're Seattle? Like, how do you do, you know, if you're a player on Seattle, like, and here we are thinking, ah, oh, they'll just turn over and get ready for next season. And the next thing you know, you know, our buddy, yeah, Samu, the title contender. Yeah, exactly. yeah, our buddy Samu is one of the captains and they're putting up 30, 40 points a game, looking like the Seattle's of years past. So. The big move, the big move. Well, the thing is, as well, if we're looking back at last week's performances, well, and, and this week's performances, it's meant that the West Coast is tied up. They, they know that LA are hosting the Utah. Um, Atlanta doing the job on Utah, though, this week, right. uh, meant that they've sort of secured their place in the finals. I think it's still possible for Rooney or, I think it's just Rooney to, to have a home, I, you know, some... It looks like that Atlanta are going to be playing at home anyway. Yes. It doesn't really matter as a result. LA sort of closed things out. They shut the door on uh, poor old Austin, though. Austin had the door open with Atlanta winning, but they yeah. couldn't get the win at LA. We sort of said that that might be the case. LA, yeah. you know, losing to Nola, they want to right some wrongs. They want to be confident going into the playoffs. So, uh, yeah, Austin have had the door closed and Utah clinched that second spot in the West Coast Conference. Yeah, that West Coast is, I think, if I'm, am I wrong in thinking that LA is actually playing Utah this weekend coming as well? That they've got the, it's like they have to play each other back to back. Is oh, that really? I might be wrong in that. I might have yeah, just okay. seen that and misread the date, but I think that uh, be, either way. I'm not sure. It, it definitely could be, you know. I'm yeah, not... either way, it's, it's, that's going to be an exciting game. And then if you think about the fact that, no matter who wins this game between you and New Orleans, but like, you know, if you, well, time out for a second. Let's go back to when you played New Orleans down in New Orleans. Yeah. That was a disaster for you all. <laughs> so if it goes anything like that again, we could end up seeing New Orleans and Atlanta. In the I know. It, it, literally, that's the thing. That is the craziest thing about this league. Anything can happen. Right. 
And literally, right. like, I don't want to talk about anything happening because it will do the opposite or we'll do it. And you just don't know. Anything. I think the quote that I have from you, Ben, in my text message inbox is... Oh, no, yeah, you can't read that out. <laughs> That's private. That's private, Mike. That's between you and I. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's been it really done, man. You guys got to do it. You got a job to do. Yeah, it has yeah. to get done, right? Well, I mean, that's the thing. I think the mentality... The tricky mentality thing is this, is that, oh, we just need four tries or we just need to stay yeah. within seven or, you know, the mindset we need to have at Rooney is we need to win the game. Right. Go exactly. in there to win. win the game. Correct. And, and don't worry about all this or only losing by this or staying or getting four tries. Go and play a game of rugby solely to win and you don't have to worry about anything else. Just Correct. Let the rest take care of itself. Yeah. So hopefully that's what we'll be doing, quarterfinaling it. Know that there's a big one the next week in the semi-final, and then it's all for the for the main event. But right. it's been an exciting two weeks of rugby. Really has. Yes. Like, no, it has. It's been things, awesome. Which is probably, you know, the MLR are probably like licking their lips thinking what a they, great outcome because they couldn't have scripted this better if they, they wanted know. to, right? Like they really couldn't have written the script for the season better. I mean, they, they had all the hang-ups with COVID early on. They had to delay things, and it was like coming and hawing about whether or not they were going to play and how it was going to go. And the next thing you know, you're at the end of the season and everyone's like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all good, man. It's all good. Yeah, this is um, pretty good. Let's talk about some of the other results as well that happened. Surprise one, uh, DC went and, uh, and gave uh, San Diego. A, a, Where did that a, come a, from? That, 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 that caught me for sure off guard. Yeah, but, 100%. No. I didn't see that one coming either. I thought DC yeah. were, you know, fading really badly towards the end of the season. And suddenly pull it out of the bag and yeah. and I like San Diego I think they're a good team yeah. so DC yeah. showing some some spirit and some fight and winning that one 38 29 yeah yeah um, well yeah I, like you said caught me off guard I, I had no idea totally thought San Diego would run, would run with that one for sure but you know Danny Tusitala and and the teams uh his teammates at DC did a great job they did they did and then also well not I sort of expected this one New England you were sort of saying that Toronto being at home, but New England went and played Toronto. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that Toronto, you know, obviously losing a lot of players, but um, they've, they've been spirited in the games and it wasn't like a complete disaster. It's 28-17 to, to New England, but New England are sort of running running quite hot now towards the end of the season. It's a shame that they weren't, you know, yeah, right. the games right. could have gone their way and they'd have been right in the fight. Well, they certainly were hot against you guys a couple of weeks ago, but you're right that they could have really made this really interesting with four teams in the mix at the end in the Eastern Conference. But about Toronto, I saw a picture of uh, Aaron Carpenter, who used to play for Canada, played in the UK for a little while, mm -hmm. a friend of mine that we played against each other for years. And it was a picture of him with his kids and with his family landing home for the first time. And I, and I, and I saw that pop up and I thought to myself, I, I don't know if I could have done that. Right. And, and it was just it was just such a heartfelt thing that, you know, the big sign that said, welcome home, Dada, you know, and yeah. I thought, oh, man, to be away from your kids for that long. And I know and, crazy you know, must have just been such a grind. So I'm so happy for them that they're back home. And then the real punch in the guts was I think I saw recently that they were thinking about opening the borders up to people that were vaccinated between the United States and Canada soon. So it's like all of a sudden the major the rugby season ends. And, and the world opens up again. It's always the way, mate. It's always the way. What's going on, guys? Chan Saguski here. Uh, play for Rugby ATL. And you're watching the Rugby Clubhouse. All right, Ben. It is my distinguished pleasure to introduce not only – a person who is now sitting above you in the standings in the Eastern Conference of Major League Rugby, which I'm sure makes you not so happy, but sitting above you in the standings, former teammate of ours from New York, former All-American out of Lindenwood University, a USA Eagle, plays for the Rattlers, Rugby ATL, and also the creator of the Rattler logo, I believe, I do believe, we'll get to that in a little bit, but a graphic designer as a side job, just a side geek, Chance Wengluski, welcome to the USA Rugby Clubhouse. How are we doing, gentlemen? Thanks for having me on. It's a complete honor and pleasure. Thank you. Mikey, I think you'll find that they've been, a, they've been above me for the, like the last five weeks, dude. I think I've been <laughs> sat up with the East Conference for a while now. Uh, that's all right. Just putting a little bit of salt in the wound there. We're, we're trying to like <laughs> build, build you up. Because like, New York's got to win these next few games, like we've been saying. So, you know. Just trying to give you some some fuel for your fire, right? There's, there's five over. there's five points between us, Atlanta. Zero points between us and Nola. Five points between them and Atlanta. It's all the play for. It's all exciting. But chance, chance, he does have. Even though you're ahead in the standings, he has beaten you both home and away, right? He ha he has got that one up on you. 
Yeah, that's that's for sure. You know, I can't can't uh can't deny that one. That's a sad truth. But you know, maybe we'll meet in the finals or something. We have a little uh cheeky, you know, <laughs> get our one out of the three that we've done well, in the past. So that's we'll the see. thing. That's see who comes out on thing. top. That's the thing, buddy. I'd much rather lose both games and have a have a ticket to the grand final than be sitting watching it at home. So agreed. The agreed. bragging rights mean nothing when you're not at the big dance. So at the moment, <laughs> listen, you guys are in a in a great spot at the moment. I think you're you'll definitely believe that you'll take something, anything from your next two games. I think you're pretty much through because Rooney play Nola in their last game this, of the season. So someone's got to slip up some point somewhere. So let's have your thoughts, Chance, on, on you know, your mentality going into these last two weeks because it's not, it's not d- dead and buried. It's not, it's not a done deal, but you guys know that you, it's there for the finishing and it just takes one big performance, really, and, and you're through to the through to the Eastern Conference Finals. No, you're you're you hit the nail on the head. Um, for sure. I think the mentality we've been going on with every week, you know, especially coming off of a bye week this week, is just one game at a time, one day at a time, one session at a time. You know, so at the end of the day, like as much as we want to think about, you know, the final and playoffs in general, like Utah is on our plate right now and we're gonna clean it. So that's that's our mentality, just one one game at a time, you know, and hopefully the points on the, at the end of the day, at the end of the game show that, you know. We're going to be on top and hopefully continue to stay on top, you know, until uh, until the end. That's so good. You know, I've heard that expression so many times about so, someone's on our plate right now, but I've never heard anybody actually finish the finish the expression. I mean, like, we're going to clean it. We're going to clean our plate. Right? Like, yeah, I've heard that so many times, but I've never heard someone finish it. So well done, Chance. That was, that oh. was great. Chance, <laughs> Chance is a front row. He always finishes his plate. <laughs> always finish a plate. Makes you got to look it clean, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Chance, oh. I was talking to you off air before Mikey joined us and I was just saying that one of the most impressive things about Atlanta this year is for me is that you just have the the most complete squad you know we talk about uh, teams losing players uh, and you saw it early door with Atlanta you've got injuries guys stepping up filling those holes and playing well and becoming you know starters and it just seems like there's a lot of um competition for spots healthy competition for spots in your squad which means that you know guys are getting better they're pushing each other driving each other tell us what it's like as being being part of that squad you know is it i do you feel that you're a really bonded unit and that you are working well together as a 35 month squad people pushing each other testing each other bringing each other on oh 100 it, it's it's really cool as far as like just the number not just a number of people but like just everyone can play different positions at the end of the day. There's a lot of guys who can cover, you know, wing, center, fullback, sometimes 10 as well. They can cover the whole nine yards. Um, I think Alex Mon can cover hooker, tight head, and loose head. Like, we have guys who can cover a lot of different positions, which continues to raise the competition and all those places. So no one feels safe at the end of the day, so to speak. Everyone's, you know, knows that they have to grit their teeth and, and continue to push through if they want to get on that, you know, that 23-man roster at the end of the day. So, you know, having, you know, 35 guys who are hungry to play, you know, 23 guys who are only going to make the, the roster for that week. It, you have to really leave it out on the pitch, you know, come training time and come lifting time and really, you know, show your IQ as far as like what the plays are, how we're going to do things and just ready to tackle the next opponent. So, yeah, I, I think the the competition in, in our squad is is extremely solid. I'm, I'm really proud of the boys for, you know, showing up every day. And it's, it's hard to sometimes. I mean, sometimes going on an eight week game streak and, you know, you get tired over time sometimes personalities clash a little bit but I, I don't think we've had that issue I think a lot of the guys have kind of kept their eye on the prize so to speak taking one day at a time and, and really just bought into the process so yeah I'm, I'm truly blessed to be around these group of guys they're, they're a bunch of humble dudes which is really cool and I heard that I heard that um, they run quite a tight ship up in Atlanta that it's quite tough you, you don't really get you know they're one of these like I would say old school teams but they're in terms of like your training is hard do you know what I mean and it's yeah. long at times. If you don't get it right, then then they'll keep you on the field. You know, you're a fully professional setup now. So, mm-hmm. you know, they work you hard in the gym. They work you hard on the field. And obviously that's paying off dividends because the way you guys are playing at the moment and the season that you've had, you really are, you know, in such a strong position at the end of the year. And do you know what? In the only game, everyone's always talks about LA winning that West Conference and you sitting at the top of the, the Eastern Conference. I could see I could see Atlanta winning against LA again uh, in, in the grand final if you make it. So do you think that goes down to sort of like 
those hard yards of, of working hard in the preseason, working hard during the season, keeping your fitness levels up. I know you spoke about that as well before, getting your meters up, running with the back rows. Um, yeah. is, that, is that part of the parcel as well as of, of being you know part of the Atlanta Rattlers? No, I think that's I think that's it to us uh, for a T. Anyways, like I think you know, I feel like we're continuously trying to chase that perfect game, and, and as much as it's like you want to like chase it, and you know things are obviously going to slip up here and there. But obviously, at the end of the day, everyone's trying to make that perfect performance. At the end of the day, when we played LA, I think the boys put a, a, like an outstanding defensive performance with a stupid number of tackles made and and so and so and so forth. But at the end of the day, like we're still chasing you know perfection, so to speak, and. You know, obviously, hopefully we can pull that, you know, together come playoff time, come, you know, come Utah, come, you know, Boston. So I think, I don't know, we're, we're hungry. I'm not really technically satisfied with L.A. Like, I want to go back and, like, properly finish the job. I don't want it to be as close as it was. So I, to me, I'm like, have this, like, F you respectfully mentality to everyone we come across. I'm just happy to be, get on the pitch. If you look at me before the ball kicks off, like, I'm smiling ear to ear, just ready to, like, smash heads. So I don't know. I'm excited. You know, like, I, I just want to play, period. So you, you, didn't clean, you, you didn't clean your plate, Chance. You left, you left some little scraps. I left plate there. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't few, totally yeah. clean it. <laughs> Definitely left a few crumbs uh, on the on the plate for sure, which hopefully we can clean up in the future. So, Chance, I'm going to let you into a secret. I'm going to let you into a secret because you are, you know, you're a young pup as well for front row. You're only 24 yet, 24 years old. Yes, sir. Jeez. I'm going to let you into a secret that Mikey knows as well as I know. There is no such thing as the perfect game, mate. That's why we all have to keep training. We all have to keep lifting. We all have to keep going forever and ever and ever until you're like me and Mike and you're too old to play the game anymore. But it's not a good thing. <laughs> and I'm happy with that. You know, I'm happy with chasing this idea of perfection, chasing the exactly. sunsets we'll chase or whatever you want to call it. It's like dangling a carrot, mate. You'll never get it, but we all chase it. We all chase it one day. 100%. Before we go backwards, I have a question because I want to, I want to talk about your, you know, you're still young, but I want to talk about where where you came from and, and your early rugby and how you got sort of your pathway towards first rugby united new york then rugby atl of course but some we, we talked about the fact that you're a graphic designer and we'll again come to more on that later but this rattlers right like the the sort of monomer that comes with the with the team that's organically come out of rugby atl yeah is that something that as a culture, your team identifies with and embraces, and it's something that you kind of have as who you are, or is that more of like a social media branding thing? Or is that something that's actually part of your team and your program? Like you guys, you know, you have the snake pit that's there and it's like this, this uh, yeah, exactly. Like the <laughs> hand gestures, like the snake pit, or is it not, is it just kind of a, and I don't want to say smoke and mirrors, but is it more for the show than anything else? No, no, I, I think at the end of the day, I think I go back to Scott Lawrence and, and, the, and the people and the staff that he chose for this team. And it's very much just a blue collar mentality. I think Matt Heaton said it best in a previous interview. It's like we it's just a bunch of hardworking dudes who want to work really hard for each other. Like I literally just got back from headquarters and just like cleaned all the toilets like like we just have certain jobs that like little groups have to do when we clean up after each other. And like we just get gritty. And it's like even though it's not like like. I'm not studying plays or I'm not running through drills. Like I'm trying to like hold, like it's a firm foundation to keeping it clean, knowing what we have and continuing to build off of that. So, you know, as much as like cleaning toilets is never like the prettiest job in the world, it's, it's still, you know, it's, it's something that we can just take charge of, you know, I think at the end of the day, like everyone has like to take their part, whether it be, you know, in the starting 23 or not, like everyone has a job and everyone has to fulfill it at the end of the day. So as far as like, yeah, kind of like a motto of having a snake fit, like we take honor and have like heavy privilege to like play where we're at and, and have like the number of people who come out and just support us at the end of the day. Like nothing, nothing's better feeling than having like, like maybe a great comeback or just like, like tackling a team to completion, knowing that like we have fans that are supporting us and, and just like family members, like we have a big like support system here that I'm very heavily proud of and can just look out and see everyone cheering, like jumping on their feet. Like, I think that's something to be, you know, proud of. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Of course. It just, it's, it's always interesting to hear about, we've had players from different programs, right? And every program has its own unique identity and its own unique culture. culture. And when you sort of follow rugby ATL, as far as mainstream social media goes and what's out there in the public eye, 
there's that that logo that you made you know the the rattlesnake and the rattlers and the snake pit and it's like i wonder how much the players have that as part of their own identity and who they are as a team right and that, oh, so yeah. it was, it's just interesting that was all so anyway we can we can now go backwards ben because i know we always like to talk about <clears throat> where from whence from whence they came right so where did where did chance come from <laughs> No, uh, Chance came from Tulsa, Oklahoma, a small little uh, suburb town, <laughs> uh, playing football um, pretty much all throughout my childhood. Um, position? Wanted me to tr- what, what position? I want to know position. Give me a position. What were you? Uh, defensive end. I was on the front line like I am now still, so <laughs> <laughs> not much of a change up. But, uh, but at least uh, you get to touch the ball, dude. If you were playing defensive end, you, you don't really touch the ball. Now you at least get to touch the ball. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I get to see all, I get to see it go between my legs every every game. That's always a uh, <laughs> always fun. But uh, no, yeah, I pl- played football all throughout like elementary, middle school, high school. Um, I actually ended up getting invested pretty heavily into wrestling uh, my eighth grade year, and literally did that through my entire high school career as well. Um, and then yeah, I got asked to come out by a friend's older brother. Actually, he was like I think he was five years older than me. He's like, yo, you're a big kid, like coming out, give it a go. And I was like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Came out, like, didn't understand the, pro- like, the concept of, like, not being able to block or, like, being able to, like, throw the ball forward. That that was all new to me. But, uh, yeah, I literally ended up just playing all three of those sports throughout my entire high school career. And and uh, originally went to college, uh, Linwood University, for football. Um, but I told the head coach, I was like, listen, like, I want to play rugby in the spring. Like, this is something that I'm, I'm really passionate about as well. He was like, yeah, yeah, totally, 100%. Um came rugby time, came rugby season, played the season with the boys, um, just enjoyed the culture, like, really, really well. Like, it was just it was just different. Like, football, nothing to bash football with or anything. I love football. It was obviously – spent a lot of great years doing it. But I think at the end of the day, the culture that was surrounding, like, rugby and, like, the people that are brought together, it was something that I couldn't explain. And I just wanted to be surrounded by that atmosphere all the time. So, stuck with – ended up sticking with rugby for the remainder of my college career. Um, got to work up, you know, do the rankings, so to speak, with collegiate All-Americans, under 20s, under 23s, and then uh, got the honor and privilege to, you know, slap on the, the USA jersey officially um, with uh, starting against the Maori All Blacks in Chicago. Um, that was a great experience. And then uh, getting my first official cap in, uh, in Ireland in Aviva Stadium. So, yeah, I've been I've been truly blessed, truly truly honored by like kind of the, the stepping stone, so to speak, as far as kind of working my way up through the process. Um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people are going to be able to kind of take the same route that I took. I think a lot of people are going to, we've got this new thing called the, you know, the draft and stuff where people from college are, you know, going to the MLR teams. And, and I, I think that's a great, great way to, you know, get, get people more invested into the process. So, you know, um, just excited to see what, you know, the future holds, you know, uh, but yeah. I think that's kind of just a little brief history. Well, Chance, Seriously. you've already done like a lot. Oh, you're 24 years old. And like, you know, I know props who played till they were 37, 38. And they say you don't really hit your like peak maturity as a prop till you're like early 30s. So that's what excites me about someone like you. And especially the, the fact that you only picked up a rugby ball at what, like 15 years old? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. you sort of like, you know, your story is exactly what we want to see in the future in terms of like finding guys. And it's weird that you talk about culture because every single person I ever meet that goes into rugby or the thing that gets them, the thing that hooks them, because obviously we love the game and the training, the physicality and all that competition. But the thing that always hooks everyone is culture. And um, there is something about playing rugby and, and having that culture because you know, I've experienced and come across a lot of other sportsmen across my time, and know that none of the I don't I don't other sports have it. Like, don't get me wrong, there's always a degree of culture, but I just think there's something about rugby that brings people in. And so, what was it that first grabbed you when you talk talk about culture? Just you know, hanging out after the games, you know, having a coke or you know, eating sweets when you're young to having a beer now that you're older, or seeing the opposition and sharing a you know, pint with them, or what 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 is it about rugby that that sort of is that culture that you talk about? No, yeah, I for me, you know, growing up in America, playing all these American sports, you never really have that, you know, like kind of like chat after the after a match of sorts. Like like your opponent was always your opponent, and you'd always continue to look at him as your opponent. But like 
I step on the pitch with you or something and I'm like, Hey, how's it, how's it going, Fody? Like yeah. have a little bit of small chat on the side and like, you, you can just get away with that knowing that like you've had like personal chats off the pitch and, and, and you be able to share like a pint afterwards as well. I think not a lot of sports have that ability, I feel like. And, and obviously like due to the quarantine and, and COVID and such going on in the world right now, it's obviously kind of, kind of squeezed that down a little bit as far as the ability to do so, but the, the atmosphere and the culture is still there, you know, and, and people can still chat, catch up. Like I, I rugby for me has made me have friends all across the world that like, I didn't think was even possible, you know, like coming from just a little tiny town in, in Oklahoma and in the suburbs flatland, so to speak, like my dream was to, you know, branch out and meet as many people and invest myself in as many cultures as I possibly can just to grow as an individual and, and obviously as an athlete at the end of the day. So if I were to narrow it down, it's just like to be able to have the camaraderie after, you know, matches and stuff, I think is something to like really, you know, be proud of as a, as a sport that it has that, you know, full on aura around it, so to speak, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's sort of like the respect because like, like you say, before the game, I'll come up to you and we'll have a chat and see how each of them are doing. I know nothing would excite you more and your eyes would not light up better if I was running down your channel and you know, oh, yeah. Seven bells out of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that is something about rugby as well. You just you can't wait to sort of you know smash your mate or step him or fend him off just so you can see him afterwards in the pub and be like, "Hey, mate, I got you." <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. That's exactly it, though. At the end of the day, I th I think that being able to smile while you play is gives people all the reason to play into the late forties, late fifties, late sixties. Like it doesn't matter. Like it always gives a reason to put a smile on your face when you know you can step on the pitch. And, just play with some old friends or old enemies, so to speak. So it's it's all good at the end of the day. Like I I know chatting with Matt Heaton, he's on the Canadian squad. He he's getting ready for the qualifiers for Canada, and like I'm getting obviously ready for the qualifiers with USA as well. And and, and we we don't even like chat banner very much. Like we're just like oh, I'll catch you on the pitch when the time comes, you know. So it's it's all like fair play at the end of the day. So no, nah, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I think I think everyone should just get involved in the game as soon as possible. I, I was lucky enough to start at 15, but at the end of the day, like if I could have started at like three, four, like <laughs> slap on the boots, and just let's go. You'd be wearing 15 though, mate, or a 10 if you did it then. No, oh, I don't know about that. Still, there's there's was, versatility. There's versatility in the Atlanta squad, Chance. You can yeah. step in and play 10 next week. You don't know. That's, oh, just be ready. I don't know just be ready. <laughs> yeah, just I don't know ready. about that one. Chance, you, talk, you talked a little bit about – so you brought up a sport. With a lot of the people that we talk to and a lot of people I talk to, and when you think of crossover athletes, you think a lot about football players, right? And you talked a lot about your football career, but the one thing you did talk about that you really enjoyed too was wrestling, right? And I, and I yeah. think that it's kind of an interesting one when you talk about – high school wrestlers making the transition to rugby and off the top of my head, the one person that really said, there's two people that really stand out to me as far as wrestlers go that really made big names for themselves in the U S and one was Dan Payne, who obviously I'm sure you know, well, and his legacy down in, in the Atlanta mm -hmm. region, uh, almost been, so, you know, I don't know if you know, Dan Payne, he's now the current high performance director here for the USA national team. He was, the, he was the director of rugby down in Atlanta. He's a USA Eagle at the 2007 World Cup. To, he almost made the Olympics as a wrestler. Like he was With so a name like Dan Payne, how can he not be a wrestler, mate? Right, exactly. Right, exactly. <laughs> not sounds runner. fake, doesn't it? It yeah. sounds fake. I call Dan Payne. Yeah, you wrestle. I know you wrestle. Whether you wrestle <laughs> on the match of the Olympics <laughs> or you wrestle in the WWE, you're wrestling either way. To make this even better, his brother played in the NFL for like 12 years or something, or like 11. Years. He was yeah. just like a yeah. His brother was a was a NFL basically like mainstay. Just please um, tell me I'm going to bring the pain when he's the smooth. <laughs> <player. laughs> but then the other name that stands out is Paul Emmerich too. Another you talk about icons of the game in the United States. I mean, Paul Emmerich is at, certainly somewhere at the top of that list. But, like, what is it about wrestlers and the transition into the game? Is I mean, I, there's obviously the rucking where you get that sort of physical contest. I mean, you play in the front row probably as close as it gets to actual wrestling, maybe. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I've never wrestled and I've never played front row. <laughs> but how, how would you describe that transition? And would you encourage people who are wrestlers who may be wrestling in high school and are looking for something to do in college? Like, is rugby something that they can just step into pretty seamlessly? Uh, to, yeah, to a certain aspect. Yeah. Kind of, um, I know for me, like my, my move was kind of like a sweep single. So it's all about leverage. Um, I think when you're, you're limited to like a, just a strict circle when it comes to a wrestling match. So if you take the circle away and you 
continue to have that same concept of using leverage on your side. Like you can, you can put yourself in interesting positions where you can end up still being on top or at the same time, like I know when it comes to freestyle wrestling, like it's a lot about exposure points and like not being, you know, kind of exposed, so to speak. So with that being said, it's like when you complete a tackle, you can just roll right out of it, get back to your feet immediately rather than like taking your, you know, sweet time getting off the ground. Someone might not know how to properly like kind of roll through a tackle or like complete a tackle, finish through, and then like get back on your feet. It's all about for wrestling. It's like, how many times can you get on the ground and get back up like two times faster? So like, yeah, I, if you're, if you're a wrestler and you, you're trying to get into the sport of, of rugby, like, yeah, you might need to learn how to rerun again. Cause that's how I had to do it. I would go from wrestling season to rugby season. And like, I couldn't run like 10 meters without like collapsing just cause like you're restricted to that circle for so long and you have to relearn to run, but yeah, no leverage and like just body positioning is, is massive. So I know that for me anyways, it was never that much of an issue to like just throw myself at someone's shins because I was doing it for so long in a, in a wrestling mat. So, you know, just kind of bringing that same kind of concept of just leverage and shooting through and just like, finishing your tackle so to speak instead of getting two points I'm, I'm getting a positive grade tackle or I'm getting a neutral grade tackle where I'm putting my team in a better position to you know hopefully get a turnover or they're going to kick it back to us so yeah I think if you're a wrestler I think you definitely make the make the switch if need be for sure is is wrestling big in the UK Ben like growing I was, up I was just about to say to you have you never did you never get wrestling coaches coming and teach you mate it was a massive thing for us for well, around- Pain, right? Pain, Dan, Dan Payne was the guy, like, he because I, I was young, Dan yeah. was old. I mean, he, he like revolutionized the contact area for us in terms of like it was just that oh. it was a madhouse when you talked about how going into rucking drills and practice and all this stuff we were doing. The neck roll that's now illegal, yeah. We, we were coached the neck roll by yeah, us too. Yeah, us too. And, like, grab him by the neck, roll. grab him here, yeah. twist him, like, snap his head off, like, literally, <laughs> there were the things they were saying to us. I was like, Christ, I'm never going into a ruck again. I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay and hang out at the back. I want yeah, to good. I'm good. Chance, I want to talk to you about your, because um, uh, like I said, you're young. You're only 24 years old. Talk us about your international experience. Because obviously that's that's like a big change. And, uh, and obviously now rugby's professional in America and it has been for the last couple of years. But, and the crowds have been slowly getting bigger. But I'm guessing the first time, you know, you know, you played at the Aviva Stadium and that's like a monstrous stadium. You know, Irish fans are Irish fans, so it would have been packed out with, you know, how was that experience? That, that was your first cap, you said, for your, your first cap was against yeah. Ireland, in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Talk us through that then and, and that whole experience of playing some of the best players in the world in a packed out Aviva Stadium, one of the most, probably one of the newest rugby stadiums in the world at the moment, I think. No, yeah, I, I played them. I think it was fresh off of uh, Ireland beating New Zealand. So, like, I think Ireland was actually number one, like, at this time and, awesome. like, in time and place. So, kind of just, like, for me, I, I playing, obviously, the Maori All Blacks, like, two weeks prior, um, you know, I was just, like, it seemed to be, like, it was just a quick call up. And I was, like, oh, I'll, I'll you know, fill, fill the shoes. I'm obviously going to, like, take full advantage of this. And mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to play, like, 76 minutes in that match. And I, I put a good enough, you know, you know, good enough show on, so to speak, for uh, for for Gigi, and and uh, got called up two weeks later to come and play in Ireland. So, yeah, just kind of just like surreal moment for sure. Never been to Europe at in my life at this point, and just kind of just taking it all in, so to speak. And uh, yeah, man, I, I'm I'm still kind of like I can still put myself in the exact same place when when I'm walking through the tunnel, so to speak, and fireworks are shooting off, and and drums are getting bashed, and like you can hear the roar of the stadium, and you're just like. Oh, this is surreal! Like it's something I've never seen before. Something you'd only see like in like a like like a Star Wars movie of some sorts, with just like all the lights and the lasers going off. Like it was mad. I've never seen anything like. It. I, I I tried my very best when I like lined up and like grabbed jerseys with my boys beside me. I tried finding just one empty seat in the entire stadium. I couldn't <laughs> find one, and I was like, "Oh, like this is like legitimately happening." And then next thing you know, like this little Irishman comes out and it turns out to be the president of Ireland. And I was like, Oh, I'm about to shake hands with this dude. Irish shook hand. Yeah. I shook hands with the man. And I was like, Oh, thank you so much. Like was super knows. like just, yeah, just like was, was, was just stoked out of my mind. I couldn't believe what was going down. But at the same time, like I, I just trusted the process mm-hmm. and like knew, knew the plays, knew what I had to do once, once the time came for me to, to hit the pitch. And 
oh man, I'm pretty sure if you rewatch that game, you can still see the whites of my eyes just throughout the entire game, just strictly just because I'm just like so like like this is like happening. Like I'm like I'm here right in the moment. Like oh man, it's it's something that like for me anyways, just going back to where I grew up, like something that only like kids can dream of. And I, I told myself like when I bought fully bought into this process of like wanting to like become a US Eagle and stuff that, you know, like I'm gonna give myself like a, a time frame, so to speak. Like let's let's try to make a like a line of like trying to get capped at the age of twenty two and and I, I surpassed that, you know, you know, by my efforts to get capped at twenty one. And I was just very happy with, you know, with that. And it, it's only made me, you know, continuously want to get better and stride mm-hmm. to, you know, not just be the best, you know, person and player that I can be, but also like the most intelligent and knowing my roles, you know, whatever the game plan may be coming into a game. So, you know, MLR has done tremendous amounts of work for me, specifically with just allowing the number of games I've played, you know, going against such good competition and, and you know, the, the competition continues to rise. So, you know, it's allowed me to kind of figure out my own sort of vibe, sort of, uh, I guess, figure out my strengths and weaknesses, so to speak, and making those sharper and making them, making the weaknesses become more of a strength. So, yeah, like my international experience has, has been definitely mind blowing. It's definitely been surreal to a certain extent, but allowing myself to keep in those, keep present in those moments is definitely, definitely been hard at times. Definitely have to rewatch the film a few times just to remember the games, just because you're so lost in the moment. But uh, no, I, I, that 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 cap for me was everything, and it still is everything. And I I try to hold myself to that standard of play and higher every day as it comes. Well, I can so see. Hang on. Wait, wait. So hang on, hang on, hang on one second, Ben. I have a, I have a very important question. When the president of Ireland walked up to you to shake your hand, did you give him the four hundred handshake? All right. So I, I think I've said this before, but I think I was next to uh, Samu. I think he's playing for Seattle right now, and he was yeah. like, "Don't do the handshake." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I'm like looking up at him. I'm like, all right. All right. <laughs> I just kept it like I was like, yeah. Samu was chewing I'm, his tobacco like, bruh, don't do the handshake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, don't, do that. don't do that. He probably doesn't even remember, but like I just remember that, and I'm just like, yeah, like that's fair. All right, I won't do that. I would hate, I would hate for them to like think that I'm like grabbing for his like inside pocket or something, and then security jump on me for whatever reason. Like, I don't know, that probably wouldn't be a good case. Oh, like, dude, that. that caught me so off guard when you did that to me when I met you at Randall's Island that time. You're like, hey, what's up, I'm Chance, and then all of a sudden you grab my forearm, and I was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> what you the whole way. <laughs> I've gotten so many questions about that handshake, but at the end of the day, like if you get that handshake, you you you're a brother in my in my uh, eyes. Yeah, of course, of course. I wasn't trying to take away from that. I definitely feel honored, Chance. I just <laughs> was wondering if the president of Ireland had made it to that elitist state. <laughs> was he in the brotherhood? <laughs> yeah. I have to have a personal chat with him first before that goes down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, John, yeah. I'm gonna ask you uh, my final question before we let you go because we can talk for ages. I can see how excited you get by the game of rugby, which is so good to see in, in such a young player. Fast forward the clock 10 years time from now, Chance is 34 years old. He's been playing top level rugby. He's got 60 caps under his belt. You have got a home World Cup. And I saw the excitement and the, in your voice and in your face when you talked about getting that cap in Ireland. How would you feel about playing a home World Cup in America in somewhere like SoFi Stadium with not 60,000 Irish fans, but 60,000 American fans screaming you on, friends and family sitting in that stadium watching Chance compete at a World Cup where hopefully America have taken drastic steps in, in, you know, becoming a tier one nation to compete with the likes of New Zealand and England. Can you see it happening? Is that the goal? That is... 100% 100% the goal. I think that's, I think it's something what American rugby players have been striving for for years now. And, and I think just with the pickup of the MLR and stuff, it's, it's making it more and more of a reality at the end of the day. And, and for me to like see that as a possibility for me to actually live, you know, through the process of it becoming as big and as like, hopefully, you know, like you say, 60,000 people in a stadium, you know, chanting on like USA, USA boys and like USA rugby players and just the USA team in general, like, Oh man, like that, just the thought of it, Loki gives me goosebumps. Like I, I know that for me, like I want to see that day and like I want to have the jersey on when that day comes. So, you know, for me, oh man, oh, there's no word, no, no words can describe that, man. I think at the end of the day, like that's something that 
I'm striving for. And I just want that for this country as well. So, oh, no, 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 no words, man. No words. No words. Well, the bits ben, are in. Ben, you're giving us are... chills, man. You're giving... This is going to make me want to go back. I'll be like yeah. 47. Mikey, I, I know you're really. I'm so old. Like, I'm sitting at home like, oh, I can't believe it. Jeez. Uh, I thought you were going, though. I thought the question, Ben, when you when you started talking, and you, I thought you were going to be like, all right, like a job interview question. Ten years from now, where do you see yourself sort of thing, right? And I'm, okay. I'm saying anything to myself. Ten years from now, where do I see a chance? Like still playing for the Eagles. Maybe coming back to New York, right? Not that, not that you dislike. But <laughs> maybe you know, we know you all had a good experience at Randall's Island. We all know that Randall's Island is your favorite place to play rugby on a weeknight. One hundred percent. Who doesn't love a roller coaster in the background? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, my my thought, Chance. We didn't really talk about this. I kept saying we'll get to it. We'll get to it. You are going to be like a graphic designer for either a surfboard brand or a skateboard brand or start your own brand of like something, because man, when you used to sketch that stuff on the airplane, when we were driving to games, that was unbelievably and without question, some of the coolest artwork I've ever seen. And just so creative and just so organic. And, and it was an expression of who you were. And I, and I remember you said to me, like, just tell me what to draw. And I was like, how about an octopus? You drew this like wild octopus. It was so cool. And I thought to myself, this looks like it belongs. You ever seen like lost surfboard brands? This looks like it yeah. belongs as one of the lost surfboard brands, like artwork on their surfboards. It was unreal. It was so good. So that's where I see you in 10 years, Chance. I don't know if that's where you see yourself, but that's it. That's no, I like that's actually a good point. Like, you know, I, I've always had this dream, like even since like grade five, like I was like, oh, I'd love to be like a tattoo artist. Like that's like kind of been my like background dream that I've kind of just like, left back here in the back of my brain like oh someday someday so like who knows like maybe in like 10 years from now like i'll be doing some tattooing doing like some graphic design you know like have my own kind of business so to speak and kind of just rolling with that maybe like i'd be i get hopefully can make a big enough name for myself that people are like coming to the shop getting some work done and like oh you need a logo or like you need some like board designs done like i'll crack those out as well like so you know i, I don't know it's it's fun being an artist so to speak because you know, you, you only have like certain times between the day where you can maybe draw or knock out a few drawings. I actually did a, like a logo design for Alex McDonald, just knocking a little logo out for, for my buddy. And I was like, oh, like, this is the dream. Like I can, I get to play rugby and I can, I can draw on the side and like make a living off of this if I wanted to as well. Just, just got to put in the time and efforts with that as well. So it's, it's a talent that I never want to let go. I've actually went on a little dry spell, not, not drawing too many pictures for a little while. I was like, nah, I got to change this guy. Just got to get back on the grind again. So uh, my wife's laughing over here. She she's like, shut up. But <laughs> but, uh, but no, like I, I yeah for sure. Ten years from now, hopefully you know I'll be tattooing a little bit on the side, knocking out some logos and designs, and you know still bashing it on the pitch. So that's well, look, the plan. James, when you release your first skateboard or surfboard with your with your artwork on it, you let me know. I'll be first in line to sort of pick one off because man, that was that was cool. That was real cool. One hundred percent. No, Mikey, <clears throat> Mikey, you can't have the you can't have the skateboard or the surfboard, but you can have the tattoo. I I specifically said the artwork on the <laughs> No, you no, can't put a sticker on a Lamborghini. Man. I, love, I love it, and I love that that's your passion, but I, that, not my thing. But you, but that's you know what? All due respect, and I think that that would be super cool for sure. No, one hundred percent. I tell my wife this every day. You don't put a sticker on a Lamborghini, so. It's all good, man. I understand. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love that. I'm going to go with that. That's it. Don't yeah. on, on that note, Chance, we're going to say goodbye. And thank you very much for jumping on the clubhouse. And in 10 years' time, I can't can't wait to see you tattooing Mikey and uh, and bashing heads <laughs> in SoFi Stadium in the World Cup. So good luck with the future, mate. And good luck at the weekend. And hopefully I'll see you in, on the field pretty soon. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been it's been a complete honor and pleasure. Ple <laughs> Can't even talk now. It always, comes, it always comes up at the end. I always start stuttering toward the end. But no, nah, thank you guys truly for having me on. It's, it's been a pleasure. There we go again. Privilege. Sheesh. Get me off the air, man. Whatever. <laughs> oh, man. But truly, thank you guys. It's been a Cheers, pleasure. Buddy. Thank you, man. I got to stop Thanks talking. <laughs> hey, my name is Corey Lemonnier. This I'm ex-NFL player, and this is the USA Rugby Clubhouse. Okay, it's time for our second guest this evening. Very excited about this guy. Uh, sports royalty over here in America, born in Florida. He was drafted in the third round 
by the San Francisco 49ers before having a stint at Cleveland Browns, Detroit Lions, and New York Jets. He's a state champion, I think I'm right in saying, um, from Auburn. Um, uh-huh. It is none other than Corey Lemonier. What's Corey, up? how are you, boy? Good, good, good. Having a beautiful day here in the Bay Area. Is that um, where you're based at the moment? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like currently looking for, I'm moving into the city proper. So just been kind of hectic with work and stuff like that and packing and all that. So, yeah. It's great to have you on because obviously rugby being a new sport, trying to like build momentum and popularity in America, mm-hmm. the, the sport that it's trying to reach the heights of is obviously the NFL and American football, which is sort of the, the mecca of sports in America. So having someone on like you is, is, is real special. Um, so we're just going to dive into sort of like, tell us like how it all began for you in the football. Cause I think that's so exciting for, for anyone sort of in that world, because, you know, you play as a kid and then suddenly you realize that, you know, you've got a knack for something and you become, you're a talented sportsman. Tell me about the transition from when you, you know, stop, stop playing for fun and you realize there's like a pathway of a career yeah. and, 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 and that sort of beginning of your sporting career. Yeah. Thank you for having me on, uh, Ben. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, going on Instagram and all these like and see that the rugby is kind of growing in the United States so that's that's good on for good for rugby <laughs> um so to de- dive into it I started playing basketball in middle school and I'll play like you know Pop Warner my one of my basketball teammates was like hey play Pop Warner and stuff like that and I come from a very traditional Haitian family so football wasn't like their sport like <laughs> or anything like that <laughs> so they were just like you know, they, they, they brought me there, but they're like, my mom would never show up because she was like, she was kind of scared of me getting hurt. Yeah. And my dad was there, but he, he didn't understand what was going on. We were, we grew up a Dolphins fan, but he, he didn't know what was going on. And so, um, played, I was more focused on basketball because we went to the finals in middle school league, I guess, and all that stuff. So I was like, man, I'm going to grow up to be Shaq. Um, <laughs> and I went into high school and in my freshman year in high school, I didn't grow past six three, so I was like, I can't, I can't live that uh, power forward center days at six three. So my high school coach was like, hey, uh, football coach walked up to me and was like, hey, you should play football, because uh, one thing is uh, my dad bought me and my two brothers a Bowflex in elementary. So we had this huge contraption in front of our yard and it was like a basically a prison workout every day after school and we're just like going going ham on uh, on the Bowflex and we got to the point where uh the weights were too small and we put our little baby brother on it and the wire just snapped. <laughs> so uh you know so we we've always been like in fitness my mom would you know my my older brother was like a little bit bigger so he would um she would have us run outside the block the whole entire time for cardio. And then, yeah. <laughs> so we were like, you telling me you were in prison when you were a kid. Like, <laughs> yeah, just with your yeah. parents over watching for you, st- making sure you're doing weights and running. For stealing Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, we've always been in, I was always been in that fitness aspect um, um, world. And so then when I went and when I played in high school, my high school coach walked up to me, I was already 6'3". I was already lifting heavy weight in the gym. So it was just like, it, he was like, it's a natural fit. Come play football. And I was just like, I don't know. Like, you know, this is not, I'm going into like the big boy leagues, high school. You know? <laughs> like, I don't know about this. Um, and so I started, you know, started playing. I remember uh, the first, uh, the first scrimmage we had, it was with like one of the best teams in the nation, Naples. It had like, two first round offensive tackles and I played deep and so I had to go against them two first round offensive uh, tackles uh uh I think a second round running back um everybody was really good on that team all this stuff and I I remember my first game and I didn't know how the bathroom situations work <laughs> like when they use the bathroom so I remember just like uh I just remember like how to like run to the sideline i was like hey i have to go number two <laughs> and was like, I'm like, what are you doing you have to play right now I'm literally so I was, shitting myself my <laughs> like, like mentally and physically <laughs> so uh, so uh i was getting dogged the whole time i was like they were destroying me all the stuff i was kind of like wet behind the ears and then 
after that, I was just like my one of my teammates who also was a first round draft pick for the Chargers. He like kind of took me under the wing and he was like, look, this is what you need to do. I remember I was he would make me do the pool around the ring, which is all which is banned in the United States now. But <laughs> <it's basically, laughs> you get somebody um, and you get one player, you put them in the, in a in a circle and it's a player. It's like a, a man made circle. Yeah. And a coach yeah. will call out the number for anybody in that circle. Yes, and so you, yeah, you have to keep your head on the swivel. And so when they say like 66, you have to turn around real quick and you have to butt heads with them. When and you say it's, when you say it's banned, what, like, I, I don't really understand what the NFL police are coming around, making sure that I, yeah, that in training anymore. That. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a, a football police, Larry, with a hat with the football on it <laughs> and a badge. <laughs> Um, points off your NFL license if you call it yeah. <laughs> so uh did that and my coach brought me to a camp in Lakeland Florida which is like up north Florida like nothing around there and it was called down and dirty I just remember it was a a, a field that was not the best kept right yeah. and the water was fed to you by a PCP pipe with uh <laughs> screw holes in it connected to a hose and that's how you got your water. We we felt like like actual cattle, like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, what a great lineup! It was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like I went there was just like I'm gonna completely dominate this thing. I don't care how like how I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna dominate. And I did. I like every drill. I was set, I was set to win every drill, be the fastest. Like you know, like if I was not the strongest, I was gonna leverage my speed against them, all that stuff. And I won, I won the whole tournament. And I, that was like the aha moment of just like, okay, like football can be a thing for me. And then played my, that later on that year, my junior year, like, you know, had a successful career, like um, season, first round, uh, first team, um, all state, and then kind of transitioned to then like the letters start came, um, coming in. So it just made it more uh, reassuring that, okay, this is like, can be a thing. And then my senior, the same thing, first team all America, uh, first team, first team all state. And then I got a Under Armour um, acceptance to come to the game um, in Orlando. And after that, I got another uh, All Star game in Hawaii. So I did that. It was that was cool to go as like a 16 year old to Hawaii. Um, and then yeah, that was like my aha moment. And then I had five visits to go uh, see colleges that I was really interested in. And it was um, LSU, Illinois, um, <laughs> New Mexico for some reason, <laughs> um, Tennessee, Tennessee was one, yeah. and Florida State. And I was just like, you know, they're showing me everything and all that stuff. And you feel special, just like, oh, my God, these people really want me and all that stuff. And, <laughs> and when it came to it, I didn't know where to go because I was getting pressured by so many teams. And, they're, and I was just like, you know what? You know, screw this. I'm my re my protest vote. Like I was like, you know what? There's these really good schools that I really want to go to, but they're all want me so bad. I'm gonna go with the protest vote and just go to Illinois, which was like, you know, unheard of. Nobody even heard I was like in their radar and stuff like that. And then my mom pulled me to the side and she was just like, Corey, you're going to Auburn. And I was like, okay, I'm going to Auburn. I wanted to talk to you about that decision. Like, how do you make that decision? Because in the movies, you always see it's a massive, massive thing when people are deciding the you know it's a, a big decision because obviously like education is, is massive but also like mm. if you want to put yourself in the window to be like an nfl considered an nfl you know draft you need to be at one of the bigger universities and you see they sit there with the caps and it's like oh who do you pick and then they eventually yeah. pick that and put it on did you have the whole hat thing or was it just like a yeah no i i i, I had the whole hat thing and everything i think one thing is uh you know, education was a big thing, especially for my my mom, because again, they were that big into sports in general. And so they wanted to go, they wanted to know that I was, you know, getting a quality education and Auburn uh, provided that too. I think it was like, because my aspiration was to make it to the NFL, it was just like, okay, what team is going to get me there the fastest? And one thing is that when I met with the Auburn coaches there, they, they were straight up with me. They were like, Corey, you're not going to, you're not going to start your freshman year, but like if you'll get playing time, but you have to earn that playing time because they, they had a bunch of seniors coming back. Yeah. And which was a plus for me because it was like, if I stay there three years or four years, whatever, 
three out of the four years I would be playing and I'll be underneath at least like a senior so I can like learn the ropes of like, yeah. you know, how to be like, prof like professional and how to like conduct myself and what to expect and not just like rely, like not just like, I mean, coaches are good people to like rely on, but it's like that game time experience, you need like a senior leadership to like, you know, That's really right. like, you know, teach you the ropes and stuff like that. So I had that at Auburn and and plus, like we we Auburn had, I think, one of the best recruiting class that year. And so that was like, OK, like I know we're going to be good in the future because, you know, we're bringing so much talent into Auburn and stuff like that. And, you know, we have all these five stars and, you know, um, that the big uh, the big announcement of like Cam Newton come to the school just made it even more so. And I was just like, OK, you know, this is going to be special. Yeah. So it was kind of like a mix of everything, like where it was like, OK, we're going to have a good team. Like it's setting me up for the future, like and also good education to like I, I know where I'm gonna go in there and get all those check boxes like hit. But this uh, is this is your mum thinking, not you, because you were like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm going to Illinois. Yeah, you know, know. I just carry the team on my own. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so then when, when that that was the thing, like when I was uh, when I was all deciding, it was just like, okay, you have Auburn who check all these boxes, but LSU wins championships. They're doing all this stuff and then it's like uh, like you know tennessee i would play right away you know like yeah. all like and so all these different factors and it's just like okay like uh, i'm getting pulled from different angles and stuff like that i was just like you know screw this where can i go where i know i'm gonna play early when get an education <laughs> all this stuff and like but the thing is like they weren't they didn't have like a really good recruiting class or you know not not dogging on them but they didn't have a good team at that time but like like I said my mom was just like she she got really close with all the coaches at Auburn and it became like a family thing yeah where the coaches were in contact with her the whole time and her English was wasn't that good but like they they like made it a way to like communicate with her and like yeah. she was like she felt that she was like being heard and accepted which was like amazing for to keep her calm the whole time you know yeah. and then you know, because like before then, my mom never watched me at a, a single game in high school. Yeah. So it was like, because she was so scared of me getting hurt. And so when I went to Auburn, my, uh, I think it was like my first or second game, she actually came and it was like, my friend was like, oh yeah, she was closing her eyes the whole time because she was scared of you getting hurt. <laughs> so it was, it was definitely, but that, again, it was, it was, it's all like Sorry. my, my mom's decision and like my decision too, ultimately, like, but you know, at looking back at it, I would never change anything. That was probably one of the best decisions of my life, going to Auburn. Um, met so many, like, close friends, good uh, relationships there where it will last me a lifetime. And tell me about that step up from, obviously, you're, you're playing high school football and that level. And then, obviously, it's quite a mature decision to sort of sit there and be like, you know what, I'm not going to play, but they're recruiting this guy and this guy. I'm going to be competing against really good guys, mentoring. Mm. But also the facilities. Like, tell me, about because I know that these – some of these um, colleges have like, you know, the best facilities and they have yeah. stadiums that hold 60 to 100,000 people and they are packed out for every game. Tell me about yeah. stepping into that environment. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, coming from a locker room that was uh, never painted, the uh, lockers that barely shut <laughs> and then like a uh, couch with holes in them uh, with a uh, PlayStation 1. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a <that> breaker. <laughs> In a shower, one shower that worked, <laughs> you know, going to a uh, beautiful uh, facility, which by when I went there, it was it was nice. Don't get me wrong. It was nice. But now looking back at it, like seeing all the new facilities at Auburn, I'm like, I feel gypped. <laughs> yeah, you, you missed, the, you missed the, 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 re, the, the spritz. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I, I for some reason, I didn't get the after effect of the championship money. I only got the. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a, um, no, beautiful campus. Like, I mean, you know, we, they take care, they will, like, especially uh, if you had the scholarship, like, if you were a scholarship, you know, you had the, the meals, so you never go, like, hungry. We had, like, nice dorms, you know, it was um, nice dorms, like, nice locker rooms. We had that whole, um, our, <laughs> our equipment staff was, like, its own staff. Like, you know, it was not yeah. just, like, our head coach, working as a head coach like <laughs> um, the kit and the helmets and stuff as well yeah. and you, then you got, you got to have to still studies after that you know like so it was definitely like such a cool like you know like where we had everything kind of like taken care of um taken care of and 
all we had to do is just like show up, right? Show up and just like focus on football, focus on school, because everything is like kind of like it, it. They had all the resources around you to help you succeed. So mm -hmm. that was definitely a, a huge difference from like high school going into college. And I mean, like with any, like I feel like with any um, high school kid going on to college, um, it's like that breaking away from like your parents and stuff like that, like re rediscovering yourself. Like especially coming from a very, um, you know, very old school traditional um, childhood where I really didn't even like socializing was like, like was not really new to me. Like I, I was social in school, but like I would never go into like any like parties after that or any like, like go to friends house, some of that. And when I did that, it was kind of like me breaking away and just like discovering like a new side of me. So it was just like, oh, like this, I love this. Like I, I reinvented myself in college and you know having that like football as like kind of like a pedestal to help that up and also academics friendship all that stuff it just made me like the person who i am now so yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and you talk about sort of like it's a very important you know phase of your life from when you're like 18 to sort of 22 23 mm -hmm. because things like you know drinking partying women come into the equation yeah and I don't know about you. I went through that process as a rugby player when I was 18 as well. And I saw players who went into that environment. Suddenly they started getting a bit of money, a bit mm -hmm. of like a bit of fame. And some people sort of relished it and they sort of like they could, you know, balance the sort of the social life. And, they, they, you know, they wouldn't be you know, socially impaired or anything. They'd go to functions and they go go out and have fun with them. But they wouldn't, you know, go out partying to three or four in the morning. They yeah. would, you know, they 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 pull back from it because they knew if they were going to have a professional career and as an athlete they needed to do that make those sacrifices at a young age and i did that as well you know i did i didn't really drink when i was 18 19 i really yeah. sort of like pushed away from it and there's yeah. so many things going on around in your life drinking drugs and things like that and it's easy yeah. to that world. And i saw so many players fade away who were so mm -hmm. talented and could have had a career but because you know my dad even says when he was young that he reckons he could have you know reached a, a decent standard of rugby but he just chose a different way of life did yeah. you find the pressures of that as well being at school that people trying to drag you out of parties yeah. had big games at weekends and things like that yeah definitely i think it was uh because you know it was that peer pressure right that peer mm -hmm. pressure is strong especially going to college yeah. where you know you have all the i think it's it's all like the freshmen's like you know how freshmen are all like new to the world and it's like i'm gonna do everything you know the sophomore <laughs> senior is gonna do like you know i want to be part of the crew you know all that yeah. stuff so um it was it was definitely hard like you know my first year was you know it was unbelievably unbelievable year we won the national championship all that stuff so it was like you know going out was like you especially in auburn alabama where they worship football they're just like you're treated like royalty there yeah and and that was even the peer pressure times like a hundred, you know. So that one thing I did, um, I like would say, which helped me throughout there, where I did have a good balance of like social, football, school, and also just kind of like me time. Yeah, I met this like really like lovely family when I live when I lived there, and it was like every Sunday or every at like every Sunday every like like three to three, three times a week, I would go to their house to have like a home cooked meal. They were like really close contact with my parents. Wow. So they were just like, they were, they were, they were like my extension from yeah. like kind of like normalcy. And then it, it that kind of helped me like that grounded me a lot. Yeah. And so yeah, I would just, I would go when I couldn't go to Thanksgiving dinner, um, dinners at back home in Miami because we we're in football season. Then I would go to their house for Thanksgiving because I remember my first summer there, I was homesick, like which any yeah. freshman is like their first year there, they get homesick. And I was like, I want to leave this place. I hate it. Like, you know, all this stuff, you know, it, it was during that period where schools get like, we went, we got there in summer where there's nobody there in Auburn because everybody lives in Georgia, all parts of Alabama. So it was like a ghost town. Yeah. And so you're telling uh, a kid who just got to a school, Hey, uh, you're going to be at a ghost town for like three months. And <laughs> just like, like good luck kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was definitely, it was definitely hard. And I would say that fa that family really helped me through that time. And I became really close with them um, throughout my college career. And yeah, so that, that helped me a lot. So definitely uh, to answer your point. Yeah. It, it was hard to balance the, that, that peer pressure for, from like going out, kind of like going into like, 
a, you know, bad habits, you know, and, um, but I did find a, like a family and also like a routine that helped me stay grounded. Nice. Yeah. And so you spend was it three or four years uh, at college, things are going well, you're playing well, everything's trending in the right direction. You're winning state championships, you're getting the accolades, you're on the, you come to your last year, you're on the, the radar of scouts and, 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 you know, hopefully going to the NFL. Talk me through, did you go to a combine? Yeah, I did. I did. So I and did. How, uh, I'll say it again. I was going to say, how did the combine go for you? Because yeah. I know some, some combines go real well for some people. Some people, they don't. But you're, yeah. you were quite, you're an athletic guy. That's, mm -hmm. I'm guessing, where you excel sort of in, in those sort of. Yeah. College was great for me. Like, you know, got me some, like, like I said, I got, got a bunch of accolades and then got accepted to the combine and went down to Arizona to train for the combine. And it was like, like five to six months of just like gruesome, like good work where I was like, I'm probably in the best shape of my life. And it's like, it's, it's serious. Like, you know, we had a great strength coach in Auburn, but you know, going to a facility where it's like, this is like, we're built on like speed, power, performance, all that stuff. This is our thing. Yeah. That was like, I could see why people put a lot of money into this. Yeah. Um, so did that for like, like I said, five to six months. Um, and I was probably like at 225 when I left college, when I got into the, when I got into the combine, I was at 255 of just like lean, lean, um, probably like under like 8% body fat. Uh, I was just like a, a stallion. <laughs> like I was like, <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it was, it was a great combine. Like, I, <laughs> well, the first day, the, the first day was great. Like I, we did the whole body spec. Like I was like, I did, like did well on that. And then we did the bench press where I did like, I think 27 reps of 225. I was like proud of myself of that. And then when we went to the, the 40, I, one of my roommate, I've not, I never take pre-workout. And for some reason I was like, okay, Corey, take pre-workout right now. And so <laughs> I was like, all right, this is going to help me boost this up. Right. So I took this pre-workout and I go into the, the 40 and the first time I did it, ran a, a four, six, happy about it. I was like, damn, that's fast. Like, you know, for somebody that, for a big guy. Uh, yeah, for a big guy, that's pretty good. And then ran a four six, but I ran a four six the second attempt, and the last like uh, five yards, I my both my hamstrings start to cramp up, and so like uh, I like ran through the finish line, and then bam, I'm like ah, like what is going on? And so we go into uh, the rest of the camp. I did we it was like the rest of the camp was vertical broad jump and a three cone uh, uh, shuttle. Yeah. And I was like, I can't do any of these things. So I was <laughs> like, I'm hurting right now. And, you know, I still try to do it. I know I didn't get a good time in them, but it, it was whatever. Like, yeah. I didn't make any excuses. I, I just like put my head down and just like went for it. But uh, like the other, like if I didn't do that, I, I, I blame that pre-workout. Pre-workout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pre blame the pre-workout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, reason, the reason I'm asking about this is because, the draft came in to MLR rugby last year. And so mm -hmm. we had the first collegiate draft. They were unsure about it. They didn't know how many people were going to apply. And they had some like 500 guys in the end sort of put applications for to mm -hmm. try and get in the MLR. So there was a lot of traction on that. And then this year they're doing the same again, but this year they've added the MLR showcase, which is now the, you know, rugby's combine, um, mm -hmm. which is happening on the 7th of August in Connecticut Staples mm -hmm. high school, I think. Okay. And obviously they're sort of, you know, it's very, it's a very American thing, but obviously in American football, it's massive. You know, it's on the TV, they break yeah. it all down. They do the backstories on the guys where they played, comparing yeah. everyone. And it really does have a massive impact on where you get drafted in your draft pick. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, but, and rugby's so new here that they don't have the luxury of having all the games uh, oh, you know, on telly <laughs> in college. So if you don't go to a big rugby playing college and there's only sort of a handful of them in the country at the moment, it's hard to sort of get yourself out there and, and on the radar. So it's a very interesting prospect to the, to the draft this year is because they can find guys that have only played rugby for like maybe a year, two years, but they're just, you know, specimens, just athletes, you know, guys yeah. who are rapid and they, they can be great crossover athletes. And so... Yeah. It's interesting to hear your sort of experience of all that because 
you know, that's what people are going to be going through in the next couple of months trying to get to the MLR. And obviously, it's not to the heights that, you know, the, the, yeah. the NFL have. But if I was 18 years old, I would get so excited about something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grind, actually. Like, it yeah. was it was uh, three to four days of just, like, like mentally, you were exhausted. Like, I mean, physical, thing, like, the whole physical stuff was, like, kind of, like, the easy part. The interviews are the, the tough part, I would yeah. say. Because imagine being, imagine you're... 19 20 years old and you're sitting in the couch and a professional football team bill belichick and all of his staff is in front of you with a, a white screen with every college bad college play you had <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're asking you what were you thinking on this and they're just like and then you're just like Ah, just like oh. <laughs> you know, so, I blocked that one out. I blocked it out. I blocked yeah. it out. <laughs> so yeah, it was definitely that was definitely the, the hardest part of the whole combine. Okay, yeah. so and so you do the combine. Tell me about draft day. Did you? Yeah. Uh, you're at home with the family waiting yeah. for the call. Did you? Did you have an inkling that you would be going to going to go the San Francisco 49ers or did you? Yeah. No, I did. I, I, I there was. Um, there, there was like a couple teams that are interested um, that were like calling me a lot and stuff like that. But SF came to my pro day um, and I was talking to the, the deep line coach there for a, a quite a while. So I like, you know, at that moment, I was just like, so like, you know, overwhelmed with everything. Yeah. And, then, and so, you know, when, when after that pro, after the pro day, you know, we talked here and there, but I've talked to other teams a little bit more. My agent would, um, you know, would be like, hey, this person want to talk to you, all this stuff. And so when the night of the draft day, when I heard I was getting drafted, <laughs> kind of a funny story, by the 49ers, I, I was I, I was just like in a wreck. I was in Auburn. My family was uh, flew up to watch the draft. We had like a whole thing in my, in my uh, house at Auburn. And I was like, kind of like, I don't want to be around anybody. So <laughs> I go upstairs <laughs> and I'm like laying in bed and just like, just nervous as hell. And then I go, I went to go uh, use a bathroom. Um, I went to go number one and I get uh, like, I'm here cheers downstairs and I get in a call. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, mid using the bathroom. <laughs> like, ah. What's that, what's that noise in the background, Corey? <laughs> nothing, nothing. I think nothing, there's a tap on his thing. <laughs> I'm watering the plants. <laughs> and, and so, and so when, uh, you know, first of all, were you, because I find it very, because um, it's very new to me in, in terms mm. of American sport and, and getting drafted and things like that. I think it's awesome that first and foremost, that you get an education before that all happens. Yeah. It's, that's, that's great. Just in case, you know, y y the dream doesn't happen, but were you happy with being drafted number three? Were you expecting to be number one? Were you expecting to be five? What were your expectations of the whole thing? I mean, you always want to be drafted in the first round and stuff like that. You know, I think if it was um, like, you know, if I stayed another year, I always think like if I stayed another year or like what if I did this or this and that, how would my future like shape up um, now? And thinking about it now, it's like, like I'll lose sleep if I keep thinking about that. I'd rather just be like, look, I was, I got chosen there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, I was excited. I was like, okay, like San Francisco, I've never been to California. Love this now. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, <laughs> sunshine, sunshines and like, you know, um good weather all those places time. to be drafted i'm pretty sure that. yeah so <laughs> it, it was it, it i was excited like i never never my like everything i did and like since high school since middle school it it kind of like it came back to me it was like all the times that i've you know worked like when i worked out in a crappy gym mm -hmm. when i when it was like monsoon raining in florida and we still practice when in Auburn, when it was like 115, like the, with like an insane humidity, like not 115, but like 100 plus 100 degrees and super humid. And we'll be in the indoor practicing and just all the like hill sprints and all that stuff. And like you're being up making you run around the block and yeah, yeah. On the bowstring. But, <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff, it just like all of it came into one. And it's like, I was like, I'm proud, like, I should be proud of myself. And this is like, why I'm here because like you know I, I I like to think like I it happened for a reason right because I wouldn't be on here talking to you right now if I none of this stuff yeah, none yeah. of that stuff happened right 
Like I would have met Fozzie. I would have met Tom. I would have met everybody if I, that ha- wouldn't happen. Yeah, and I, yeah. I love my life. I, I know like it, it, it all happened for a reason. So, yeah. Well, I think you, you've got something to be very proud of because you are probably part of the 0.001% who get to go and live out that. I, Cause I'm pretty sure that most kids, they grow up and they, you know, they watch LeBron James, they watch Tom Brady and they, yeah. they watch uh, a rod and they think that that's what's all about that's what they want to be and, and you yeah. live that dream you know and yeah. from from playing basketball and someone looking you up and down going oh you're a big kid and you look strong let's get you in the defensive line <laughs> yeah. linebacker and to, to live the dream of playing nfl it's just an awesome story you know yeah and and the sacrifices and the thing is this is what i always try and explain to people because the sacrifices you have to make to to, to be a professional sportsman are are huge and and they're defining and, and you, we talked about it a little bit when we said you know you go to university and you've got those decisions to make and balancing it and you said you had the anchor family who looked after you and kept you grounded and your feet mm-hmm. full. you know it takes a very special kind of characteristic to you know make those sacrifices and believe in yourself that you can make it all the way so mm-hmm. yeah um you know hats off to you for for sticking it out and uh, well, it just shows you. your your caliber of you as a person as a man you know we we have similar friends you just mentioned tom and fozzy and people like that that's how we got you on the show yeah yeah you in. Um, but you know, I hear great things about you as a man, as a gentleman, as a sportsman. Obviously, you can see by the veins bulging in your arms. You know, <laughs> you're still very fit. But I wanted to talk to you about this as well. So you go to the NFL, and you introduce yourself and said, "Ex-professional footballer, you're mm-hmm. only 29 years old." Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and is is that the decision you've taken to step away from football, or yeah. or you know, could you still hang on and play? Is there another contract out there? Are you free? Would you go back if someone came in and said, you know what, we, we need you back? I mean, yeah, if there was a, uh, you know, opportunity, I'll, lo- I'll definitely take it because it's like, you know, I think with football is so unique, uh, you know, not, I'm not saying basketball, you can always pick up a basketball and play, right? Mm-hmm. Soccer, you can always like kick up a um, soccer yeah. ball. You know, but like football, it's like a whole operation, right? It's hard to relive like that football. Um, even like when my buddies are like, hey, let's play some flag football. And I'm just like, no, like, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, first of all, it's not the same for me. Like I, you know, I don't want to be like, I want to like, I want to lift you up and how drive you to the floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I know? can't do that. I'm pulling a tag off your back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it's a, uh, it's definitely it's different now, but I think the the reason why I left is because one, like my first year I did really did really well, and then I think I kind of lost that my after my second second year and my third year, especially my third year, uh, my mom I found out that mom had uh, stage three breast cancer, okay. and so uh, it was now I was not thinking about just myself. It was just more so like everybody around me and stuff like mm-hmm. that, and. I was like so focused on like just like kind of like taking care of her, the family, all this stuff, and just like kind of like put my mindset into that. It, it didn't it didn't come about football anymore. It was just like like my well being, like my well being, my family's well being, all that stuff. And I just grew not interested anymore. And it and I, I don't think I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's uh, I, like like people always ask me like why did you stop playing and stuff like that and it's like more so like i want to do now i want to do something else that i i've done this i've did it i did it now what else can i conquer kind of thing and i didn't want to be that uh you know 33 still going from team to team just like trying to figure out what's going to happen because it's like one financially it's not that it's it doesn't work because you're going to be like on a camp and they don't pay you uh a season salary in yeah. camp and so it's like you're going, you're you're basically losing out money, and you need to make some money somehow. And I'm just like, I didn't want to be that player. I didn't want to be. I wanted to like pursue a new career, like see if I'm going to do well in that. And then when my when my like especially when my mom passed, I like she, I played. I that's when I got. Uh, um, I went to the Jets, and I did a, a full year there. It was like Jets were great. That's how I met. Um, all the boys yeah New York. Yeah. yeah so and it was just like you know i now it became like okay what else can i be in what else who who else can i be like in life because everybody found me as just like the football player the football player and i wanted to be Corey, right i just wanted to like kind of set myself as that person and then you know did that when i got done playing it was okay 
I was living the life in New York for a minute and then for like a year and a half. And then I like had to step away and I was like, Hey, this is fun, but this is like dangerous too. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I, need to, I need to figure out what I need to do next. And, and so I moved back to, I moved back to the Bay who, who which I had like a strong um, family group here too. Yeah. Um, through an extension from somebody from Auburn. Yeah. And so I always felt like this is home because like I said, in my, it's only like my dad who lives in Miami because my little brother, he's now playing with the Chargers in, in LA. So um, so everybody I know basically all live in California. So moved to California, like I, you know, went like did uh, did some like took some classes, um, worked at a, a sales job, a, a shipping logistics company. And I was like, okay, all right, let's see how this is going to play out. I, I did this for like a year. Yeah, let's see the I, nine to five. <laughs> yeah, the nine to five. I was like, let's try this out. And then I uh, did that. And I was, uh, I remember, like, I'm like, you know, uh, finishing a call. And then I turn around and this girl was like, like new to the office. Like, oh my God, like, where, where did you, what did you do before this? And then I, I asked, I was like, I played football. And then she's like, what's that? Like, what, what do you mean? And she's like, well, I used to tackle people for a living. And then she was like, oh my God, really? And then I was like, and I was like, what did you do after before this? And it was like, oh, I was with this like other Fortune 500 company. I was just like, <laughs> and it put everything in perspective. I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> it's like complete huge, like, like shift in careers and stuff like that. And then it, it, like I said, it was a, a year of that. And I was like, I love you know connecting with people i can talk to anybody and stuff like that yeah. but just being at that nine to five like office routine was like kind of like stressing on me so i was like you know do something that i love and it was fitness i mean yeah. I'm always, like i said going back to the first thing like when my dad bought me a bow flex my mom made me run around the block like and, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just like and the thing is you've been around you know professional athletes athletes and, and yeah, the trainers sure. are some of the best in the world so you're going to pick up things along the way as well so you're core values and your your core skill set to do what you're doing now yeah was already already set there you just had to yeah. sort of fine tune it yeah so i i was you know that that person that was being naive until like you know i can do the whole like bear tech thing and it's like no do what you love like do what you're, what you're actually good at and then you know started getting into fitness and it kind of just like blew up from there um now i'm super happy where i'm at right now and just like now I'm just like, okay, how can I get better from this? Yeah, it's it's yeah. It's, it's very interesting to hear you talk like that because it's, it's you're only 29 years old, but you're speaking with a lot of maturity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 35 years old and I'm still running around playing rugby still, but I'm part of a new sport that's growing in America, and that's what attracted me over here because there's so many more aspects to professional sport than just playing and there's coaching yeah. and there's the commercial side and there's you know agents and all that sort of stuff for me to sort of get involved with. It's very interesting here, someone like you say, like, you know what, you know, I want to take my own path and control it and, and find my own way. And and football's sort of you know, taking you as far as it could. And then, although, you know, you, you've massively enjoyed it and it shaped you as a human being, the essence is the fitness back when you talk about sort of your parents and all that sort of stuff, that's the thing that you love. And, and that's what you loved in the football, that the athleticism being strong, yeah. the chance to dominate other people in collisions and show your strength. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you're using that as your, you know, that's going to be your job for the next 20, 20, hopefully years. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's uh I think it, it adds a little of uh, credibility to it too, right? You know, yeah. oh, of course, uh, yeah. you know, because I've been with like world cast athlete being one myself and stuff like that. And it's just like, it's easy to understand like, okay, you know, how, like, you know, how to properly do a box jump, right? Like, you know, yeah. I train clients who I'm like, Hey, jump on this. <laughs> and they're just like, how? And I'm just like, okay, I'll teach you how to <laughs> do this. Sure. <laughs> you know? well, that's the other thing as well. When you get into sort of like this thing is, is one your credentials and two mm. they look at you and be like yep yeah, i want to look like this dude because yeah. there's so many people that, that go into this industry and you're like mm, i'm taking advice from this guy and <laughs> you know, i'm already skinnier than him i mean you know <laughs> it doesn't look like it so it, like you said yeah your credentials match up but your physical appearance as well is, is setting yeah. you apart massively yeah so no no that's uh that's that's why i love it that's why i love it so and and obviously like 
I'm playing in the MLR, and one thing that we're always sort of comparing ourselves is against the football, against American football. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the the grassroots level is the main hurdle for for any sport, trying to get it in high schools, in colleges. Yeah. But in terms of you know, it, it is a professional league now. Obviously, the money isn't massive or life changing. But how how would you think that rugby? sort of gets into the market of you know contact sports and and because the thing is with the mlr everyone is watching in terms of all the other leagues the european leagues the southern hemisphere leagues all the professional players are waiting and they're waiting for the money but obviously with the money you need sort of the tv rights you need the fans yeah. in the stadium and for that to happen you've got to convert the american public mm -hmm. to to rugby and that's the hard thing for me that's always been the hard thing and when they crack that and find the way to sort of you know it's, it's about making like American stars. There's no point in me coming over or Chris Robshaw or mm. Amar Nonu, some international players from around the world. They need to have stars who are Americans. Mm -hmm. And like, how how do you do that? How how are those sort of stars created in a professional sport? You know, from football, you, you talked about Cam Newton being on the scene even when he was signing for a for his university. Everyone was like, "Oh, Cam Newton's going." He was the big yeah. pull. Yeah. And no. How, how do they create guys like Cam Newton in the MLR? I think, I mean, like you said, like the grassroots, I think if you start um, really pushing it to, you know, the, you know, kids in high school, like middle school in the States and stuff like that, and just be like, look, this is another alternative for football kind of thing. It's, you still have that contact aspect of it. And it's like, you know, and just like kind of present yourself as that is like, this is a, a different from football and just put, like, I think put yourself in that, like, in that, in that, I guess, like, that frame and stuff like that, I think that's when you just, like, you build high school teams. And then yeah. you build, like, you know, and then high school teams, people are going to just, like, jump onto it. And that's, like, who are, who are put off from football. And it's, like, okay, like, let's try rugby now. Like, you know, let's do this. And then that's how you get, like, you know, the the Cam Newtons, the, the you know, <laughs> the, you know, just, like, the all-stars and stuff like that because yeah. now it's, they go to college, you know, you know, now college is going to support it now more so throughout the um, states. And um, and then it becomes like it's easier to, for rugby to pull people from college and make it like, I think, a legit thing. I'm not saying it's legit, but it's like it's more it makes it more le uh, yeah, legitimate and stuff like that. And then I think that the TV deals will come after that because it's like, OK, you know, now we have the, you know, the Patrick Mahomes of rugby, like, yeah. you know, that's like, what we're after. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's like the man who can like, you know, run faster than like most DBs and throw a ball better than Tom Brady. Right. You know, and it's like the <laughs> and man can do a state farm. Ab ab <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so you can do everything personal online, like TV, you know, just like the, the full package. And, yeah. you know, there's so many, I think there's so many, like, again, like, uh, if you look at the stat of football with the 5% uh, 0.5 or something like that of like um, high school kids making it to the pros, mm -hmm. I think that's a huge room of opportunity yeah. of those thousands and thousands of kids who couldn't get it, couldn't get there. Like, <laughs> hey, this is an alternative. Like, let's make you into a star kind of thing, you know? So um, that's, I think that's like a, a, a plug that's an end right there. And it's, it's not, it, it wouldn't even be hard of a sell because it's like, you like contact sports, right? <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, so here, here we have it now. So you're 29, Corey. I could still sign you up. I reckon. I know. Bobby's been, <laughs> Bobby's been on me about playing. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm close. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> okay. The last thing I want to talk to you about as well is recently uh, the football have announced that college players can now get paid. <clears throat> now, I don't know the ins and outs of it because I'm an English guy. And so I haven't known the history of, of the NFL, but what I guess, you know, watching ballers and the rock and stuff is that they've been calling for this for a long time because these schools have been making millions of dollars from, you know, these kids playing, playing American football. What are your thoughts on these guys, you know, now being able to make a bit of money on the side from, from sort of becoming a professional athlete, even in college? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, um believe like players should get paid i think uh you know going back to what i said like you know we were we were being fed and all that stuff but it was it was a struggle like we're still living in you know so a lot of players especially you know in africa like with like let's like the statistic a lot of african americans are uh are in the nfl and a majority of them are from like very 
you know, um, come from like, you know, uh, um, yeah, less well backgrounds and stuff like that. So it's, it's hard when I in fo- like playing football and my family is still struggling and you, they're basically investing. Um, you're, you're basically a stock that hasn't grown yet. Right. So yeah. it's like, we're just, and you never know if you do grow, right. It's, it's, it's risky. And so a lot of players kind of hold that, like, you know, a lot of burden on themselves and just like, shit, like I, you know, if I don't make it, then I can't feed my family. Right. And, but if they don't make it, then they're, they result to like other negative things or whatever, whatever path they do. And it's like, I think that like, just like mentally it's like, like that, that's a, that's a lot to put on a 17 year old. Yeah. So it's um, to like, take care of your family, you know? And so the thing is, and the thing is as well, is that, if you want to do, if you want to make it as a footballer, you have to like throw yourself at it completely. So it takes up all yeah. your time. So it's not like you go and work in a bar or yeah. you know, the other kids can do at university to, to make extra money to sort of mm-hmm. like live comfortably. You've yeah. got to sort of engross yourself in, in, and so it gives you nothing else. Football becomes your life. Life, yeah. And so yeah, and so you do need to have this the security of of being able to earn a bit of money and you know, like you say, provide for your family and sure. you know, for yourself. And I think it's also like, uh, I mean. My sophomore year, like I was doing well, and I'll go into a, a a bookstore and I'll see 55 jerseys getting sold. Right, it doesn't have my name on it, but it's like this is they're weird. Buying, they're buying your number. You they're know, buying they're my buying number, right? Shit. And it's yeah. like you know, let's not be like you know, like let's not be sneaky here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're selling my jersey, right? Like yeah. this wasn't here last year, right? So <laughs> it's uh, you know, and you know when Cam Newton number two jerseys out there you know i don't know like before cam who was number two in auburn history i don't know <laughs> it's like, buying those shirts. <laughs> buying those shirts, right? so it was like okay the, like who at like if it's a t- if it's coaches if it's like the um ad if it's like the whole there somebody's profiting right yeah. and i think even with these ad, like advertisements and all these things they're like they're they're profiting off um our like our like the players backs and stuff like that and i don't think it's you know, I, I, I don't think it's right, you know, and, and it, you can argue like, oh, then they wouldn't be called amateur, might as well call like set pro or semi-pro, whatever. Yeah. And uh, like at that point, I don't really care because it's like, yeah. you know, yeah. it, even if you, if even if you're, if you're like, okay, you know, pay these people, but put it in like a purse, like, so later on when they graduate or they leave yeah. the, um, college, that, that revenue that they made throughout their college, they can access it as like, you know, if they didn't go to NFL, hundred percent, yeah, because you don't want you, you don't want an eighteen year old kid or a nineteen year old kid having access to hundreds of thousands of dollars because yeah. it will ruin them. Like, sure, for you sure, know, if that's thrown on you as an early age, you, you're a kid and you make stupid decisions, and that's where you get in trouble and you'll lose a lot of good players. I completely agree with that. I think that yeah, yeah they should purse it or you know, what's it called, like a trust, put it in trust, yeah. and when you hit twenty one, twenty two, or leave college, yeah. then you get then you get given it and off you go. Hey, that, I think that I think that's a great compromise for like, you know, where it kind of satisfy players and also, you know, people who think this is going to become uh, it won't become amateur and players are players are only play for the money and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, no, really, sorry, they should put us on the board. They should put us on the board. We'll make these decisions. <laughs> We've just solved all problems. All in one <laughs> yeah. We've solved you know what? I like this idea. <laughs> 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 All right, Corey, I'm going to leave you there. We've been talking yeah. for ages. And thank you very much for, for spending the time with me and, and divulging into your past and how professional sports has affected your life because, you know, you're one in one in a, one in in a 10 million probably in, in terms of making it to the very top and uh, having a career, a wonderful career in NFL and obviously, you know, being level-headed enough to know that, you know, fitness is where your future lies as well. So it's been awesome yeah. chatting to you and hopefully young guys are watching this, whether they make it to the NFL or they decide to, be a crossover athlete and go to the combine for the MLR. Hopefully we'll see a lot more Corey's popping up on, on the screen soon. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers, dude. Thank you, man. Have a good day. Cool. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little us does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope 
where once there was only despair. Okay, Mikey, we've had our two guests on and uh, they've been very insightful. Obviously, Chase being in that American rugby world and then Corey, NFL through and through. I love listening to him, chatting to him about the story. Sorry you couldn't jump on that one with 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 Corey. You'd have yeah. enjoyed it because he is, you know, he's like, it's the sort of stuff that films are made of for me. Right. It's what I always, you know, he went to a big university playing college football, went in the draft, got picked up, played American football to the highest level and all that sort of stuff. And now he's pursuing his dream of, of, of being sort of in fitness and, and health. So all, all full circle. And interestingly, Mikey, I know you've been speaking to the guys as well, that a couple of our old teammates have um, decided to work alongside the MLR and they are doing the MLR showcase leading up to the collegiate draft which is a, a very exciting prospect. I mean, the draft was only introduced last year, so it's only natural that we have a combine for players to sort of showcase their athleticism and their skill set for, for potential link-ups with MLR teams. And, uh, you know, I, it, it takes place on the 7th of August in Connecticut, uh, Staples High School, I think it's at. Correct. Yep, Staples High School. Uh, yeah. and, and I think, you know, hopefully me and you will be there doing a bit of uh, background uh, on some of these players and highlighting some of the guys to keep an out for for the, for the 2022 season. I tell you what, they needed something like that. And it's so good that they're filling that void, right? That I know that the, the, the people that we know have stepped in and said, look, this is something that needs to happen and they're making it happen. And more importantly, you know, pretty much in our backyard, not too far off the road and up on 95 at Staples High School. But <laughs> that program, like it's at Staples High School and, and that program that's there has come leaps and bounds kind of out of nowhere over the past like couple of years. And their high school program is tremendous. Really? And yeah. I mean, just a tremendous, tremendous program. And it's led by Dave Lyme, uh, Australian guy that, that had helped, helped us actually with the New York Athletic Club with coaching. And then more recently has been really focused on his work with Staples. And, it, and it's evident that it's, it's paying off. And so here they are now, not only making a name for themselves when they went down to play high school nationals, but now they're hosting, you know, like basically an official Major League Rugby Combine. At yeah. The so I'm excited all around for not only for the team up there uh, and, and Dave was a friend, like I said, Dave Lyme, the coach that's a friend of mine, but also just, for, just for these kids, right. A chance to just put their hand up because for some of them, if they're at small schools or yeah, you know, maybe all they've got is someone on the sideline with, you know, a, like a, even an iPhone doing game footage, right? Like it's not a lot to work off of. So this gives them a chance to really meet face to face with, you know, we'll call them scouts from the yeah. NL. Well, I, 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 there's a lot of teams who have, have said they're going to send guys down. I know uh, Rugby United New York has said it. Free Jacks are sending someone down. I think Austin and a few other teams have already said they're going to send scouts down. It's on the Rugby Network for people to watch as well. It's going to be broken down into the content. I'm looking forward to seeing you know some of these freakish athletes as well because uh, we talk about crossover athletes, the future stars of this game. I think you know that could be a good way of uncovering them for the future. So looking forward to that. But also, Mikey, Getting back on track to the MLR itself yeah, into crunch week, you know, there's six games left for all the for, for the uh, inaugural season, but only really one that really matters. All eyes are on that game, Ben. All Nolan, eyes are on the Nola it. New York no game. Respect, yeah, no disrespect to anyone else that's playing this weekend. That's know? why, Mikey, I am not saying a word about it either because whatever I say, it'll come the opposite. I don't want to big up us. I don't want to big up Nola. I don't of want to course. do anything. But of I know course. that there's going to be two teams desperate to get out there, put in big performances. Of course. Be a big spectacle of rugby. So I'll let you talk about it, what you feel is going to happen, how it's going to play out. It's basically a quarterfinal with an asterisk next to it, right? So it's quarterfinal game, but NOLA has to do X, Y, and Z in order to get into it. They can't just win, right? So they can't right. just escape by on one point. But like you said, from a mentality standpoint, you know, you know what has to happen for you all to get in. And within the first 10 minutes of the game, if you're hot and on fire, like you were last week against Houston, you scored four tries in the first 20 minutes, you could have your plane ticket <laughs> ready and be done and you guys are into the playoffs. So it'd be interesting to see, like, that'd be kind of fun, right? Like 20 minutes in, it's like, I'm waiting to look down the field to see your face of relief. Like, oh man, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> like I could just, I could just sit back here and cruise now. But, you know, if, if you're NOLA, I mean, they're, 
they've got the likes of Cam Cam Dolan rejoining their ranks, you know, coming in something, I think in the second round this weekend too, uh, as, as the vice captain for the squad. So, you know, make no mistake, they're not going to just lie down and let you guys have a clear path to the playoffs. No. I think it'll be a great game. I think you are going to have the benefit of playing at home, which is going to really play to your favor. But I, I think that the hurdles that New Orleans has sort of in front of them right now are going to be a bit too much to overcome to beat you all at home. Don't you jinx us, Mikey. Don't you jinx us, Mikey. Look, you told me that I was going to be the one to have to talk about it. You just No, you know, I don't want you to do that. To us. I know that your predictions have not been coming yeah. true. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly say the opposite, and then we... Yeah. Then I'll yeah, sleep you just think that I'm wrong all the time. I see how it goes. All right, so if you're in, <laughs> I can say, look, you know what? Nola's going to win, and then we'll see what happens. No matter what, this is going to come back, and I'm gonna, something's going to be wrong with what I said. So what's the difference? <laughs> I do think it's tough, though. I think it, it's... Look, it's never a good situation when you have to win and all of these other things have to also go your way. You know that, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's The worrying thing is that you start thinking about stuff like that and not just playing a game of rugby. Do you know what I mean? It's like right. when you start thinking, oh, and same for Nola as well. If they go into it thinking, you know, with too much on their mind, thinking we've got to score tries, we've got to run everything from our own line, instead of sort of getting themselves into position to score tries, and sort of like, you know, piecing together a game of rugby instead of just throwing the ball around willy-nilly. That's yeah. where they can see try as well. They can't have it too loose because if they do, you know, if they go out with that mentality, it's, it, you know, although they might score eight or nine tries themselves, you always concede three or four from, from playing like that. Do you know what I mean? So I I it's going to be for both teams. And I don't think it'll be a high scoring game. I think that both teams know defensively they need to show up. Yeah. And I think that for that reason alone, you're not going to see a, a 54 point game like you did last week. And I, I could be wrong, right? It could be the Ben Foden show for the first 20 minutes and then four, four tries on the board. And there it's been it is. a long time since there's been a Ben Foden show going on. <laughs> <laughs> but never, better, you know, now or never, here's your chance, Ben. Here, yeah, here we go. Listen, you know me, I love a bit of knockout football. So, you yeah, know, yeah, myself for, from 16 weeks ago, just uh, uh, one moment. Um, uh, like you mentioned, you were co completely correct. LA at Utah, so it's not going to be at the Coliseum where it will be the following week, but a dress rehearsal of of the yeah. uh, of the of the West Coast, uh, Coast Co Conference final. So that'll be interesting to watch. How do you think both teams approach that? Do they rest teams? Not show too many. They ask you the same thing. What do you do? <clears throat> You're the coach. You're LA. Do you mean, like everybody have a rest or not? I mean, yeah, I think I would. I, I, think, I, think, I think I think you don't show any of your cards. It's a nothing game. You just go yeah. right. I think, okay, I agree with not showing your cards, but I think that anyone who's healthy should play, right? And I think that if they're not, because you know what it's like too, right? You don't want to be thrown out of rhythm. Sometimes if you have a week off, it's a little bit strange, you know, when you're into a season and you're playing week in and week out. If you're carrying some injuries, sure, take a rest. Yeah. But, but at the same time, when you have a player such as like Matt Gitto in your team or an Ashley Cooper or a DTA, yeah. Yeah. they're fit and healthy, and you send them out for a game like that, and next thing they pull a hamstring, or you know, yeah, they're done. Yeah, they're done. You can't That's play worried though, right? You can't, you can't play worried because then, then things do. It's like the game. It's like the New York Nola game. You can't play with things in your mind of like, no. what happens if someone gets hurt, or what happens if we give up, you know, a try, or we all of a sudden back against the wall. Now only three more to go, right? It's, a, it's like when you have tackle practice and you're like, I'm going to go fifty percent. I, I love this. It's like a mind game. This it whole is. Thing it's is just mind games. games. That's the thing. End of season, mind games. Mind <laughs> games galore. But it's like being at tackling practice and you give your mate a wink, wink, and you say, yeah, we'll do 50%. But when you do 50%, you always fall weirdly and the hip lands on your wrist. Well, exactly. It's get no more for foul. It's no good. Fast. Yeah. It is. It's a very interesting sort of end of the season for them just because obviously playing each other and then playing yeah. each other again in, in a high stakes sort of knockout game. Right. No, you're right. Um, the other games, Austin versus DC at DC. What do you reckon happens to all these other teams who know they're on in it? Do they? Do they? Are they like, oh, bugger it, we'll just throw out some players, or do they? They want to end the season with a bat. It's such a weird point. I think it would. I think it would be nice if there was some some people that they wanted to give an opportunity to to see if they can get a contract for next season, or people that have been sort of waiting in the wings. I think yeah. that this is the time that you give those people a chance. You know, if if there's a third string scrum half that you know, we're questioning whether or not we want to bring back next season. You're never going to know yeah. unless they play, right? Yes, they so, play. Yeah, yeah. You need to get yeah, the game. So this is the or young guys or guys that you know are going to be in your squad in two years' time. Right. Get, 
field. Development. Yeah, give them some yeah. experience, yeah. give them some 100%. development, and, and it creates that that bit of hunger, right? Like that there, you know, you give people a chance that they want to come back next season all of a sudden. They see what it's like. Yeah. Whereas if you play these people that have been playing all season long, the veterans are feeling probably a little bit deflated, like, ah, oh, this game doesn't mean anything. Whereas to the people that have been waiting in the wings, it means a lot to them, right? They may not care about postseason, but it's this is their opportunity. And that is what I think would make those games exciting is if you give chances to those people that have sort of been waiting for them. But I, I doubt that'll happen. I mean, if you're paying money for people to be there, you're probably going to play the people that you're paying the money to to be there. So, you know, <laughs> it's... There you go. Uh, the last game, although there is something on the outcome, it's very slight. It doesn't look like it's going to... Basically, if I think if Rooney are going to get a home semi-final against Atlanta, they have to win by a load of points, score all the tries and, and do all that, which, you know, could happen. LA are playing the Free Jacks at the Free Jacks. Did I say LA? I mean, Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, you, you said Atlanta. LA. We meant Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta versus yeah. the Free Jacks. Um, Atlanta just need to get one point and then the home home thing. But how do they how do they go into that? Are they looking to rest players up as well, guys who've got little niggles, rest them up for a for a semi because they are clinched. They're already in the the East Coast com- conference, so it's. Uh, I would think I would think if you just trying to think of Coach Scott Lawrence, and I know that Coach Coach Lawrence is a little bit old school in mentality of you know that. Well, I think I think they'll go full ball. That's, I think what I mean. that's that's I what I'm saying. It's like we had when we had chance on. They're talking. You're talking about players cleaning toilets in the, you know, yeah. in their own locker rooms at at, at their facilities. So I, I'm not sure that their administrative team is going to or coaching team is going to step up and say, yeah, you know what? Why don't we rest a couple of our key guys? I think they're going to go full throttle and try to punish New England and have one really good confidence builder before they play either yourselves or New Orleans the following weekend. Exactly. All right. Well, there's loads to think about, Mikey. Plenty of food for thought. Um, interesting chatting to Corey, just where the MLR could be heading. And we just mentioned the showcase and, and that sort of stuff. And he mentioned grassroots. That's the important bit to focus on. And so it's awesome to hear you talk about Staples High School and how their rugby programs come on leaps and bounds. So excited for the next couple of weeks uh, in many, many reasons on and off the field. Um, obviously, my head is firmly on the NOLA game. And Mikey, I'm sure you'll be there commentating and, and with the dream team. Are you down with the dream team this weekend? One last hurrah with Matt and Alex. I'm really excited. It's a good squad. And, and I hope that they keep us together next year. It would be, be a shame if they didn't. But <laughs> <laughs> I could see I could see Matt sticking around wanting to do this still. And, you know, if I'm around and, and I'm invited back, I would obviously love to do it. I'm having so much fun. You know, Alex is uh, Alex Jimo, we're speaking of. She's. MLB, NFL, right? So when those leagues start picking back up, I mean, who knows if she's if she's still around, around and willing to do some part-time work with rugby, it'd be cool, but she may end up leapfrogging all of us and back in the big time. Well, it's weird, Mike, because I chat to them about you and they don't say anything good about you, mate. So I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> uh, uh, Matt, Matt says that he carries you through every game and Alex just says you're really unprofessional, so... Yeah, I'll recommend a good chiropractor from Matt. I appreciate all the time. (laughs) Back must be hurting him quite All right, you heard it here. The Dream Team will be back for the big game against Nola versus Rooney, the one to watch at the weekend. As for me, I'll be down there playing. You can watch me on that on the Rugby Network. But as for us, we'll see you next week to talk all things conference finals, Mikey. Woo, been waiting to say that for a while.